Chapter 18, Body Composition and Nutrition for Health. All right, so let's look at the nutritional goals. For the most part, most of our diet should come from carbohydrates. That's going to be the main uh, source of fuel uh, that we're going to be using, especially during exercise. Now, we are going to use some fat, and fat is also important for a bunch of other functions as well, and we're going to get a good portion of our diet, uh, of our calories from fat. And the rest of it then is going to come from protein. We don't necessarily need as much protein as what some people may think, uh, especially if you look in like bodybuilding magazines. Uh, you know, a lot of times they'll recommend two to four, maybe five or six grams per pound of body weight. But studies have shown that it's really about, you know, around one gram per kilogram of body weight that you have per day. That's, a, that's about all you need. Now that's going to, uh, the actual amount uh, the actual amount of grams is going to fluctuate depending on obviously how much you uh, you weigh, uh, what your mass is, and also how many calories overall that you're bringing in. If you're bringing in 2,000 calories, all right, it's it's going to be a fairly low a low amount of grams of actual weight. But if you're bringing in, and if you're an elite athlete, someone who's uh, who's consuming maybe seven or eight thousand calories a day then you're going to be bringing in a lot of protein. And that might actually equate to something around two or three grams per pound, all right? But uh, in general, you don't necessarily need uh, as much as what a lot of people might think. And, it, and really, the majority of the calories should be coming from carbohydrates. That's going to be the most important uh, source of fuel. Now, looking at the dietary guidelines for Americans, um, you know, we want to get nutrient dense foods and beverages. All right. And we want to try to, with that, limit the saturated fat, the trans fats, cholesterol, added sugar that is in the foods, a lot of salt, as well as alcohol. With that, alcohol is also going to provide calories for us. Uh, and a lot of times they're seen as empty calories that don't necessarily provide a lot of nutritional value. Uh, at least what's uh, uh, the the drink that is um, that is actually has the alcohol content, but we do want to try to limit some of the saturated fats and especially the the trans fats. Those can uh, lead to consuming large amounts of them lead to uh, heart disease over periods of time, as well as cholesterol. And the added sugar uh, could uh, cause you to gain weight as well as become insulin sensitive and lead to diseases such as diabetes. Also, it's recommended whole grains, uh, wheat products, stuff that is not uh, really refined type of foods, fresh fruits and vegetables, uh, and fresh being literally they, they are fresh. They're uncooked. Now, it's fine to cook vegetables, uh, I guess even some fruits once in a while, uh, certain ways, but if you limit the amount of cooking time that you have, you're going to maintain a lot of those nutrients that are in there. If you, The longer you cook the food, the more nutrients that are going to be lost. Now, we're going to also get fiber, and the fiber is going to come from the fruits, the vegetables, as well as the whole grains along with that. And a balanced caloric intake versus output. And that will maintain weight. If we're wanting to gain weight, then we're going to increase uh, the amount of calories that we put into our bodies versus the calories we put out. Someone that might want to gain weight is uh, someone who obviously might need to gain some muscle mass. Not too often do you want to gain fat mass. Now, there could be some certain situations where you do want to gain a little bit of fat. That could be uh, at least beneficial uh, acutely, if you will. Uh, possibly may, maybe an actor going through a role that maybe needs to get a little bit of weight for it. Uh, but generally speaking, most people are going to want to try to gain muscle mass with that. So um, if we want to lose weight, we're going to decrease the amount of calories that we bring into our bodies versus the calories that we uh, expend through daily activity as well as basal metabolic rate. And we'll get into some of those here uh, a little bit later on. All right, the standards of nutrition. So these are the dietary reference intakes. All right, and these are to help guide someone um, to see if they're getting, or at least the population as well as, as a whole, see if they're getting the right amount of nutrients 
uh, on average on a daily basis. So we have four of them here uh, that we're going to be discussing. Uh, and they are the recommended dietary allowance, the RDA, adequate intakes, tolerable upper, upper intake level, or UL, and estimated average requirement, or EAR, E-A-R. So the recommended dietary allowance, this meets the demand for 97 to 98% of the healthy individuals, so most of the people uh, in, in the country. All right, and these generally are for uh, are recommended for uh, Americans, but they can apply to uh, any uh, nationality, really. Carbohydrates, roughly around 130 grams per day, and this tends to meet the glucose need for the brain. The brain is going to run off glucose. It, it is the preferred fuel for the brain. Uh, it's really the only fuel. Uh, it can actually use some ketones, basically a skeleton form of glucose, it really, pref it really prefers using glucose it itself. And that's the same with the, uh, with the nervous system. Now, the adequate intakes, these are the recommended daily uh, average intake. Uh, if the RDA, for whatever reason, is not available, uh, could be for lack of knowledge. There's a lot of, a lot of um, products out there, a lot of nutrients that don't have a specific RDA. So they'll use adequate intake levels and it's just based on scientific evidence to determine uh, what is a good level to meet the demands uh, that are necessary for someone maybe who is active for a certain age group, for gender. One example here would be fiber. For men, it's approximately 38 grams per day. And for women, it's 25 grams per day. So there's no, uh, not necessarily a recommended dietary allowance for fiber, but there is an adequate intake level. Now, the tolerable upper intake levels, these are the highest amounts that someone can consume without causing some type of negative health, uh, health risk. All right, so any type of toxicity levels um, or adverse effects that can come from uh, absorbing and ingesting large amounts of it. The estimated average requirement, this meets the requirement for about half of the healthy individuals. All right, so the estimated energy requirement, or EER, uh, this is average intake for the energy balance itself. And the daily values then, if you look on a food label, you're going to have daily values, right? And uh, they're usually based off a 2,000 calorie a day diet. Sometimes there'll be another category of maybe 2,500 calories a day. Uh, but most often it's going to be based on about a 2,000 calorie uh, day diet. Uh, that's going to be about the average. And that's where the uh, EER comes from. So let's take a look at the food label a little bit closer here. So we have our, <laughs> our micro mac, all right, or mac and cheese. <laughs> it's, it's probably the off brand of mac and cheese is probably what it is. Anyway. So if we see the serving size, the serving size is kind of is going to be the the really big piece of information that you want to you want to get. It's it's all well and good if you look down here and say, oh, it only has uh, you know seven grams of fat, or the sodium is four hundred milligrams. Uh, uh, we have trans fats. We have one gram. Uh, you know, we kind of want to try to stay away from those. That could be something bad. But you know, there's only one in there. And if we come up here and we see, well, it's only in one serving size. And one serving size is one, uh, or one, uh, uh, one pouch and servings per container is six. So if you eat this entire package, you're going to get multiples of six of these. So not only are you going to get seven grams, or if you eat this entire box, seven grams, you got to multiply that by six. So we're looking at trying to think back to third grade, 42. All right, <laughs> thinking of the multiplication tables. Yeah, anyway, so 42 grams of total fat there, and you're getting about six grams of trans fat. So you have to keep that in mind. If you look at uh, sodium, 400 milligrams, multiplying that by six gives you 2,400. 
we only need in our diet approximately 2,000 milligrams of sodium per day. So we're getting over 100% if we eat the entire box. So that's one thing you do have to consider when, when looking at uh, food labels. We're, we're getting a, a good amount of protein with that, which is, uh, that is, that is definitely good. Uh, carbohydrates, that's good. And we have fiber is less than one gram. I'll go ahead and uh, actually zoom this up here a little bit if I, if I can, so you can see this a little better. Uh, I apologize there. So less than one gram and you know, you're going to get less than six grams of total fiber. Now, you know, you might only need, uh, you know, anywhere from 20 to, you know, 40 really, uh, total dietary fiber. We'll get into fiber here in a second. Um, so you're still going to be lacking if, and if this is your only meal per day, hopefully this is not the only meal that you eat per day. But again, you have to take it, take into account the serving size and how many servings there are per container. All right. So, uh, you know, a bag of chips can, it can sometimes be, uh, a good thing, a good example of this. Uh, the really small bags of them, the personalized bags, they're going to be mostly one serving. You get a bag that's maybe a little bit bigger, maybe on the medium size, not really the big family size, but a medium size one. Uh, they're going to be multiple servings in just one container. So then on the right here, you have the daily value. And this is just the percentage based on a 2000 calorie a day diet the percentage of how much you're getting from the corresponding nutrient. So for total fat, seven grams, it's estimating about 11% of your uh, daily value is uh, coming from this one serving. All right. That's seven grams of fat. We look at sodium getting about 18% with the 400 milligrams. And again, if we multiply that by six, now we're getting over 100% of our daily value based on a 2000 calorie a day diet. It can also give you the food label can give you, uh, some data on the, uh, s some other nutrients that might not be providing calories like the vitamins in the minerals. So if we look at vitamin A, no vitamin A, uh, calcium in this is 12%. And depending on how much, uh, you know, if you happen to add milk to something like this, like, uh, like you sometimes would with mac and cheese, you're beginning, you'll be getting a little bit more, uh, with that. And plus you're going to have to add in more protein and more sugars with that, more sodium more cholesterol and more fat. So the more you add to this, you know, what, whatever you would uh, put on top of it and iron, you got 8%, no vitamin C in here. So it does give you a list of certain uh, nutrients and the daily value also gives you the total calories. Uh, if you would eat again, one serving of this, but if you eat the whole thing, multiply that 250 times six, you're, now you're getting <laughs> quite a bit of your calories, uh, from something like this. Now let's look at the classes of nutrients. So we have water, which is essential for life. You kind of got the rules of threes. If you've ever uh, listened to maybe sur survival uh, experts, they'll talk about the rule of threes, uh, three minutes without air. Uh, and you're, you know, you're going to be, that's going to be life threatening. And three hours without shelter, three days without food and three weeks with or, uh, three days without water, excuse me, and three days without food. I'm going to say that you can probably go a little bit longer without air. There's people that, that have done it. Uh, it's, it, it wouldn't be good. It would certainly be life threatening, uh, but you could do it. Uh, you could probably go more than three hours, obviously without some type of shelter. Uh, you might be sunburnt. Uh, you know, you might, you might have some exposure issues there, but you would still be alive. Depending on how much fat that you have, stored in your body, you can probably go longer than three weeks. You can probably go maybe a couple months. Uh, you know, a lot of, uh, uh, studies, uh, unfortunately, uh, studies back in world war two that happened, uh, with the, uh, with the Nazis, uh, they found out that some people could live 
up to 40 to 45 days, at least with no food. Now, water, on the other hand, if you go more than three days without water, you are some kind of physical specimen. Uh, the body just cannot last that, that long. It needs to replenish the water and you will die if you do not have water within three or four days. Uh, and, and even two days in, in some instances, depending on how dehydrated and what your water level was before you stopped uh, ingesting water. So just a three to 4% loss is actually going to affect performance. And it's the increase in core temperature during exercise and even during just sitting in a hot room or maybe just a hot environment, you know, outside, you start to sweat and that sweat is lost from the blood. And that's what causes the water loss and the dehydration. So the intake then, we just need to drink beverages. Uh, I can't think of any beverage that does not contain at least some type of water and, and even food. Food contains a lot of water. If you look at something like watermelon, it's, you know, 97, 98% water. All right. So, um, you know, and, and even things like spinach, you know, a lot of fruits and vegetables are going to contain a lot of water in them. And, and that's where we're going to get some of our water throughout the day. It's just not all drinking glasses of water um, or, uh, or pop or even Gatorade or whatever, you know, uh, it's going to be the food that we ingest. We're also going to get a little bit of water back with metabolism because when we uh, aerobically metabolize glucose or fats, we are going to create carbon dioxide in, in water. All right, so it, it's not going to be a lot. It's not going to be a, enough to sustain us. We still need to replenish our bodies because we're going to be losing it uh, at a greater pace than we're making it. But uh, we still are making a little bit through metabolism. All right, now the vitamins. We've got uh, basically two types of vitamins. we got the fat-soluble, A, D, E, and K. These are stored in the body, uh, but they can reach toxicity. All right, so because they're stored in the body, we can get kind of too much of them. All right, and, they, and fat is needed uh, to be able to absorb a lot of these as, as well. If you look at something like low-fat milk, that's all well and good to reduce maybe the amount of calories or amount of fat that is in milk. But the whole milk, on the other hand, is going to uh, allow you to absorb especially vitamin D, which is, which is in the uh, milk, usually fortified in, in milk. It's going to help you to absorb the vitamin D much more efficiently than a skim milk or maybe even 2%. 2% is definitely better than skim milk, but the whole milk's even going to be better. Now, if you have some type of lactose intolerance, I would not suggest drinking milk just to get the vitamin D. Uh, you want to try to maybe some supplementation, and there's also some other sources of vitamin D, and you can look those up. And we got the water-soluble vitamins, B and C. So the B, B vitamins are mostly involved in metabolism uh, in the uh, citric acid cycle specifically there. And we got the C vitamins that are used for bone cartilage and also connective tissue growth and uh, repair. Keeping along the same lines with uh, bones, we have calcium, which is important for teeth and bones. It gives the, the structural support for the bones. It's kind of the main uh, element in there. Now, if we look at some disease state, uh, a disease state of low calcium levels, we can have osteoporosis, which is uh, porous bones. We're starting to lose bone mass to the point where we're increasing the risk for fracture because the structural support is just no longer there. So increasing caloric expenditure actually helps to strengthen the bones. The bones are just like muscles in that they flex a little bit. They're just not completely rigid structures, right? They flex a little bit, and that flexing causes some damage just like in the muscles, and that helps to reform the bone stronger each time, right? And that's uh, why weight-bearing exercise helps to improve bone health. And it's also the reason why 
we have problems trying to uh, go to different planetary uh, objects way deep into space, actual physical human beings going somewhere because spending that amount of time in space without some form of gravity, even if even it's, you know, fake or I almost say fake, but man-made gravity. If you're just weightless the entire time, you have no uh, weight bearing on the bones and the bones tend to become weak. So, you know, if you if you study any type of space stuff like, like I do, you know that they're trying to work on different ways to create gravity so that we can maybe fly to Mars someday or fly to one of the moons of Jupiter or Saturn. But anyway, <laughs> you can kind of look some of that stuff up. It's really, really interesting to see uh, what they're trying to come up with there. And also you can take ca- uh, calcium su- supplements with this as well. Now, iron. Iron uh, is kind of in two forms, either Fe2 or Fe3. The Fe3 is going to be the uh, kind of the the form that we can actually use in the body. All right, so it, it's going to be con- converted to um, plus two uh, from plus two to plus three uh, in the uh, in the body there, so that we can actually use it. Now, it's found in hemoglobin and also myoglobin. It's also important in the electron transport chain. It's going to be kind of part of one of the steps in the electron transport chain. The RDA is a little bit higher for men uh, at about 18 milligrams per day versus 8 milligrams per day for, for females. And the, the chloric intakes are going to affect iron intake. And men tend to have higher... Uh, ingestion of iron-rich foods such as meat. Uh, females, in in general, tend to stay away maybe from uh, some of those types of foods. Uh, so they do sometimes put themselves at risk for being iron deficient. And if we look at the different uh, types of deficiencies we we got here, we have anemia, which is low hemoglobin concentration. If you in just a low amount of iron, uh, what's going to happen first is you're going to the hemoglobin are going to start to get a little bit bigger. They're not going to be as efficient as at carrying the oxygen around, and then they're going to start to kind of disappear because the the hemoglobin, the, the red blood cells, we just kind of we don't uh, they don't reproduce. Uh, once we lose them, we 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 lose them. We got to make more. But if the iron isn't there, then we're not going to be able to. I mean, we don't really need to make it. And then the iron deficiency anemia is going to be the low iron levels. And a lot of times that's going to go along with the actual low hemoglobin concentration. So getting the right amount of iron in your diet is important for oxygen carrying capacity, the aerobic capacity. Uh, Again, important for uh, exercise and aerobic activity. All right, one other point I wanted to make about calcium, and the reason uh, we get the osteoporosis being developed is that we have a low intake of calcium in the diet. And when we ingest a low amount of calcium, we got to have calcium coming from somewhere because we need it for muscular contractions as as well as other processes in in the body. And we need a, a somewhat normal blood calcium level. And the only place that we're going to get that, where the only place that calcium is stored in the body is the bones. So we're going to get that in the bones. And this is known as resorption. And the calcium is going to be taken from the bones and taken to the blood so we can use it for other processes. And that weakens over time, weakens the bones. And that's where the osteoporosis comes from. And again, the calcium supplementation uh, can help with that. But just ingesting foods that have the calcium in it are going to be uh, going to help with that. All right, and sodium. So sodium is important for action potentials in the nervous system that we uh, uh, that we may have seen earlier. The electrolyte, it is an electrolyte in the uh, extracellular fluid, and this helps to maintain blood pressure. Wherever sodium's, uh, sodium goes, water is going to follow it, so it's going to help to uh, draw water into certain places uh, to help maintain blood pressure. 
Now, if we get too much of it, this is where we can have some problems with high blood pressure or hypertension. So the, uh, the daily intake, the, the RDA is going to be around 2000 milligrams per day. On average, Americans, because of our diet, we tend to get about twice that. And some of the reasons here, we have a lot of frozen foods, pre-cooked foods that are either frozen or they're canned, uh, they're packaged uh, somehow. And to preserve the food, we have to add a lot of salt to them. So there's going to be a lot of salt intake from, a, uh, from some of those foods. And again, uh, going back to the food level, you can see the serving sizes on them. Uh, it starts to add up pretty quickly when you have 200, 300, 400 milligrams per serving and you have four or five servings per container. And, and again, that adds up uh, quite a bit. And even if you look at a package of frozen food, sometimes you'll see that even one serving might contain 1,200 uh, milligrams of sodium. Uh, or even 1,500 milligrams of sodium, even just in that one package, all right? So just in maybe one small little microwave meal, you're going to be getting almost your daily value or maybe 75% of it. And what actually happens is that since we're consuming a lot of sodium, that sodium is floating around in the blood, and that draws more water into the blood, which causes an increase in blood volume which then increases the pressure exerted on the arteries, and that would be known as hypertension then. So we have that high blood pressure. Now, the sodium can be good. That increase in sodium can be good if, for some reason, we're low on water within uh, the blood, such in times where we're exercising a lot, where we're in a hot environment, and we're, uh, we are sweating a lot and we're losing a lot of blood volume, we can try to conserve and, and keep up our blood pressure and conserve our, uh, our blood volume by not excreting as much sodium through the kidneys, and that will help to reabsorb water back into the blood. And there's a hormone known as aldosterone that helps to do that. It will uh, reabsorb sodium back into the system from the kidneys, and we can then increase uh, or try to maintain our uh, blood volume from that. All right, carbohydrates. So we got sugars, starches, and fiber. Uh, sugars, they're just kind of simple. Uh, sugars and starches, uh, essentially the, the same thing. Starch are just a little bit bigger sugars, more complex type of sugars. These are digestible. We get about four grams or four kcals for every gram. All right, we're going to break these down through glycolysis, uh, either anaerobic or go through the aerobic system through, uh, if you think back to the uh, bioenergetics chapter, we got anaerobic glycolysis or just glycolysis itself, which can be either aerobic or anaerobic, then citric acid cycle, and then we're going to completely break it down in the carbon dioxide and water going through uh, the electron transport chain then. So these are the digestible ones. Uh, and... For people who are diabetic, uh, if they still want some type of sweetened foods, they, they, they like that sweet taste, uh, there can be no added sugar in something, but they can have sweetened drinks. Uh, uh, there's certain types of uh, sugar substitutes that, that they can use. But again, there's some possible health concerns with, with those as well. As long as someone is maintaining their, uh, their, uh, their glucose levels and their insulin is uh, at a normal level, you know, they can have a little bit of sugar and just to monitor it uh, really well. Um, so there's some uh, extra reading you can, you can look up on that. Uh, fiber is a carbohydrate. It, 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 by definition, it is a carbohydrate. It's just non-digestible. Uh, if we had a couple more sections of stomach, like a lot of animals have, then we would be able to digest it. Uh, but we just don't have uh, have the enzymes necessary to uh, to digest it. But our large intestine and, and a lot of the bacteria in our large intestine really love it. And uh, so, so these are like cellulose gums, the bran in different foods. The cellulose, if you look at uh, a piece of celery, 
and you bite it off and that real stringiness that sometimes gets stuck in your teeth, that's cellulose. That's, that's being, uh, that's basically forming the celery, which is where the word celery comes from is cellulose. So it does provide satiation. It, it, it makes you feel a little bit fuller than what you normally would if you maybe ate the same amount of something that, didn't, that did not have as much fiber in it. So it, it is good in, in that sense. And again, it also helps to keep you moving. <laughs> uh, kind of a nice way of putting it. It, it moves the bolus uh, or the food bunch. Uh, go, it helps it move along the, intestine, uh, the intestinal tract. And it reduces the risk of constipation. So it helps keep you regular. And it also does produce gas. And that gas is coming from the bacteria that's breaking down that fiber within your large intestine there. Uh, but again, that, that's, that, that's a good thing most often. So it's, uh, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It could be socially unacceptable sometimes, but it's still not too bad. At least from a physiological and, and health standpoint. All right, and fiber also helps to reduce cholesterol levels within the blood because uh, the, the cholesterol helps uh, the, the bolus move, uh, move along. It also helps bile, which the bile that's trying to break down some of the food is also cholesterol-containing. So it helps to move it along and uh, become lost in the feces then. So it reduces the amount of cholesterol uh, within the body then. So again, fiber is kind of a, a, a twofold benefit. So again, whole grains, uh, the skins of different fruits and vegetables. If you're eating potatoes, keep the skin on the potatoes. That's good source of fiber. Uh, not peeling apples. Uh, the, those are good sources of fiber. And fats. So we got triglycerides. So these are the storage form, uh, or and they're going to be in the adipocytes. And remember, uh, this is where the fat soluble vitamins are going to be stored. Also, fats are important for maintaining the cell membrane. They're going to basically make up the cell membrane. These are the the phospholipids. Uh, that are the lipid bilayer that's going to uh, help structure the cell membrane. Also, they're going to be important in hormone synthesis and help for uh, regulating certain hormones as well. And we got cholesterol. Uh, we cannot use cholesterol for energy. If if we could, we could get a lot of energy out of it because these are these are big molecules. Uh, tend to con contain a lot of fat. Uh, for the most part, contain a lot of fat, especially the low density lipoproteins. Uh, they have more fat and cholesterol in them. Uh, these are seen with high fat diets, and they do tend to be associated with atherosclerosis and coronary heart disease. With high density lipoproteins, they actually help protect against uh, against the um, card uh, coronary heart disease and certain va uh, cardiovascular diseases. And really cholesterol levels, uh, the, the, let me backtrack here a second, high-density lipoproteins help to remove the fat and cholesterol from the blood. So they, uh, that's kind of their whole deal is uh, they, we, we benefit from the HDLs because they try to remove the fats and cholesterol, where the low-density lipoproteins, they just kind of, they're just kind of there. They, uh, yeah. So the, so the high density of the proteins transported away from the blood, away from the, uh, the, the blood vessels and your total cholesterol level is going to be determined on, on a few different, uh, ways. Your, your gender could be part of it. Her heredity is, is going to be a huge factor. Your genetics uh, some people just naturally have a higher cholesterol level. Cholesterol is made in the liver, and it, it, it's going to be released from the liver. And some people just produce some more of it. Uh, exercise is going to play a big role. Exercise helps to increase HDL, which, again, moves cholesterol out of the way. And also your, your diet. And we've seen um, that... Uh, 
uh, increasing fiber in the diet can help decrease the amount of cholesterol that is moving around in the blood as well as having a low cholesterol diet can also help with that. If you're eating a lot of high cholesterol foods and you're not getting a lot of fiber, you're not pushing it through, then you could possibly have a higher cholesterol level. All right, protein. Protein is not a major source of energy, and it, and it really shouldn't be a major source of energy. Now, consuming high-quality protein is, is key here. Lean meat, something with a little bit lower fat, a little bit lower cholesterol in it. Uh, even things like nuts or beans, legumes like peanuts, things like that, they're going to have a good amount of protein. In fact, a, a good source, as long as you don't have an allergy, a good source of protein is peanut butter. Uh, I've, I've heard of uh, some bodybuilders, some power lifters that wanted to get more protein and they would sit there with a tub of peanut butter and a spoon and just start eating protein. It also has the good fat in it. It has a lot of mono and polyunsaturated fatty acids uh, versus the saturated fats. Now you got to kind of watch with it because it, it can be a little bit high in calories, but for the most part, it is a good source of protein. Also getting the essential amino acids. The essential amino acids are amino acids that our bodies cannot make on their own and we need to ingest them in, in the diet. And if you eat meat, it's going to be a complete protein, meaning that you're getting the all the essential amino acids, no matter what type of meat it is. It could be fish, eggs, uh it could be venison, uh, it could be steak, you know, whatever it is, you're going to be getting all the essential amino acids. If you're a vegetarian and all you're getting is plant protein, then you're going to have to figure out uh, which sources of, uh, of, of your diet are going to contain what amino acids. You need to make sure that you're getting all the essential amino acids throughout the day. Also, the branch chain, branch chain amino acids... Uh, these are going to be uh, important, and they're also essential amino acids, and they're going to uh, be important in uh, in helping to build the the muscle and and repair. And they are leucine, isoleucine, and valine. And again, these are these are part of those essential amino acids. Now, again, on average, going back to the first slide. Uh, about 0.8 grams per kilogram for the average individual. For an athlete, 1.4 or 1.0 to 1.4 grams per kilogram per day for an athlete. Uh, it can maybe go up a little bit higher, maybe to 1.7 grams per kilogram. Much past two grams for every kilogram of uh, body mass, there's not much of an added benefit from it. All right, so evaluating the diet, there's a couple of different ways you can do it. Um, really, there, there's there's two big ways that most people, most dietitians will, will try to try to get. There's there's other ways a little bit more specific, but you can do a dietary recall. Now you can either do 24 hour dietary recall, which is essentially if somebody comes comes to you and you're a dietitian. And, you know, they want you to try to figure out, you know, what their diet consists of and how healthy they are, at least their dietary habits. You just have some, all right, write down what you've ate in the past 24 hours. And they would write down everything that they've ate, drank, how they cooked it, approximately how much the food weighed, how, uh, you know, what volume of drink it was. Uh, this can be a little bit tricky because you have maybe some memory issues with that people could be lying about it uh you know they they might say that they ate more of something that they would conceive good such as maybe a salad oh it was a really big salad or they could say that they ate a little bit less or maybe didn't eat something at all that they really did eat something like uh you know a big you know, maybe like a half of uh, an apple pie or something like oh, like that. That maybe a little bit higher in sugar and uh, maybe some fat in there and a lot of uh, uh, you know a lot of sodium. So there can be some issues with that. Another way is to look at a three to four day dietary recall. 
Uh, you can even do it up to seven days. If you do three or four days, you really need to tell the person to pick uh, two or three weekdays and pick at least one weekend day. And they would just write down as they're going what they're eating, how much of it, uh, name brands, maybe even keep some of the food labels, um, you know, when they're eating, uh, everything, how they're cooking it, everything about their meals. And again, there could be some possible memory issues with, with this. If they forget to write some down, they maybe write it down later and they forget that they ate something or maybe how, uh, how much of it it was. Also, they know that they're being tested and this could affect the way that they eat itself. So they, they could change their diet because they know that somebody is going to be looking and critiquing their diet now. So that could be an issue and that, and that again is a limitation. That's kind of the same thing with the 24 hour recall. If they don't do it right there, if they don't actually recall it at that moment, they actually say, okay, for the next 24 hours, write down what, uh, what, what you're eating. So there are some limitations, but it does give someone a good idea of the dietary habits. It's not perfect, uh, but it is, uh, it is okay. All right, let's change directions here. So we've seen nutrition. Let's look at body composition. Now, the first one we're going to look at is body mass index. And this simply just takes your weight in kilograms divided by your height in meters squared. So it's simply a ratio of your weight versus your height. Now, one of the biggest limitations of body mass index when looking at body composition is that there is no point uh, in this calculation that takes into account your body composition. <laughs> so even though it is lumped in with body composition analysis, it doesn't actually say anything about your the composition of your body. All it says is your weight and your height. It doesn't take into account muscle mass or fat mass, nothing. All right, so that is the, the major limitation there. Uh, the good thing about it, though, it can be used for very large populations. If you're trying to get a, a, a decent estimation of body composition, and, uh, and again, this is going to be based off of studies. Uh, uh, the, um, the scale, uh, we'll see here, see here in a second, the scales of, of the BMI, they're based on a lot of studies that have looked at uh, relationships between the BMI number and disease risk. So you can get a good estimation, uh, large groups of people. You're talking about hundreds, maybe even thousands of people you're trying to get data on. Uh, going through something that may be a little bit more time-consuming and some of the ones, some of the body composition analysis that we'll see, just like if you look below here, the DEXA scan, it might cost a little more money. It takes more time. Body mass index, you just weigh someone and you take their height. I mean, literally like 30, 40 seconds, you're, you're done. Um, for a DEXA scan, you're talking 15, 20 minutes, probably. All right. Uh, so going back to, to BMI for children, sometimes this number can be thrown off a little bit just because children, especially around nine, 10, 11, you know, up to even 14 or 15 years old, they're growing and some of them might be growing at a faster rate. Uh, so they might be really tall and lanky at a certain point. They haven't, you know, filled out per se, and they might show a low BMI. Some of them might be growing kind of out where they they might not necessarily be gaining a lot of fat, but they're maybe gaining some muscle mass. And that could be construed as someone being obese because they have a high BMI now. And, and that's where you get some issues. If you've seen in the news where some parents have been upset because their child was sent home with a note that they were obese when they clearly were not, uh, but it was just simply based on, on the BMI. So sometimes you do have to be a, a little weary of body mass index. Again, there, there's some good ways you can use it, uh, but it does have its limitations. Now, dual en energy X-ray absorptiometry, which is a mouthful. <laughs> so the short term, uh, short, uh, um, uh, short hand is the DEXA scan. So it's a whole body x-ray. Uh, it provides detailed body composition. 
of, and it even does it in different quadrants. It'll do, uh, it'll give you a body composition of your right arm and your left arm and your right leg and your left leg, your torso, your midsection, uh, your, your, around your pelvis and also your head. So it breaks it up into different areas. Not only does it give you fat mass and fat free mass, but it also gives you bone density. So if someone uh, is maybe osteoporotic where they're having low bone density, they can determine uh, what their bone density is and it's very accurate and they can determine, you know, the correct procedures to move forward, maybe with a supplementation, uh, different exercise, rehabilitation or uh, nutritional habits. The downside of it, again, it takes a little bit longer, about 15, 20 minutes. It's, if you ever see one, it is, it's kind of similar to an MRI scan. If you ever got an MRI, but without the claustrophobic tunnel, uh, it's just a big, uh, basically a contraption that just kind of moves around your body and you, you know, you're laying flat on this bench and it moves around your body and it gives you a nice detailed, uh, body composition. It is expensive though. <laughs> that is one of the biggest downsides. Uh, a, a DEXA machine costs somewhere in the neighborhood of 20, 120 to $130,000, if not more in certain circumstances. So it can be quite expensive. Uh, most of the time these are going to be hospitals, uh, labs that have gotten significant grants uh, to, uh, to get this piece of equipment. All right, so looking at BMI, these are the classes under the BMI scale. So we have underweight, and sometimes with, with this, if somebody is really tall and lanky, uh, like, a, like maybe a basketball player, they could be seen as underweight, and underweight is, is – usually seen as there could be a possible eating disorder. There could even be something that is going on in the intestines, maybe something like Crohn's disease. Uh, but again, with athletes, sometimes you have to take into consideration just looking at their, at their body. Really, you really have to almost look at them to determine, well, are they really that underweight? Are they, you know, even though their BMI says they are, you know, if they're six foot five, and they weigh 100 and, uh, you know, 90 pounds or 180 pounds, well, it might not necessarily be they have an eating disorder. It just be that, you know, that they're just kind of tall and lanky. And we got healthy, 18.5 to 24.9. These are going to be the low-risk population. Overweight at 25 to 29.9. And then anything over 30 is considered obese. And you have the different classes of obesity, and they increase in the risk as you move up. Now, again, one thing to consider, and this again, one of the limitations, again, for an overall general population, BMI is not that bad. But for athletes, sometimes it can be uh, a little tough to de determine. It, it's probably not the best thing for uh, to determine body composition or healthiness through BMI with athletes. Because if you take uh, a bodybuilder, if you take Arnold Schwarzenegger and his peak bodybuilding uh, weight and height when he, uh, when he won Mr. Olympia, he was approximately 35 BMI. I th I think it was around 34 and a half or so. Uh, we'll, can, we'll just put him here in obese class one. I don't think he was obese. <laughs> if you look at a lot of the pictures of him back in the seventies, early eighties, he was a quite fit in individual. Um, or at least he didn't have a lot of fat mass anyway. So uh, and, and even uh, a lot of football players, you know, anyone who's muscular, they're going to have a higher BMI because just, you know, any given uh, area of muscle versus fat, the muscle is going to weigh more. It's going to be more dense. So the, the BMI isn't going to necessarily hold up very well to someone who is a little bit more muscular or someone who's maybe just really tall as well. So again, good for general population maybe not so great for uh, athletes or most athletes. And again, looking at the body compass or the body mass index and the risk factors. So if we look at that, that BMI of around 20 to basically 25, we have a low 
risk for any type of disease, either digestive d- diseases or cardiovascular, uh, gallbladder, diabetes. And again, over here with get uh, getting really, really low on, on the scale, getting a BMI well below 18, could be some digestive problems going on. Uh, but as you increase the body mass index, then you're going to increase the risk factors for cardiovascular, gallbladder, or uh, possibly getting diabetes. Uh, and even some types of cancers could start to uh, to develop with that as well. All right, bioelectrical impedance analysis. This is a weak electrical current that is flowing through the body. And there's going to be an impedance that the body has to that current. And it's going to, basically, there's going to be a machine. Uh, the The electrical current, is you don't feel it at all. Just two, a couple of electrodes that are hooked up to either, to your hand and your feet. It just runs through. Uh, and it's pretty quick and, and, and simple. And uh, the principle behind this is that muscle has more water and electrolytes than fat does. It's not necessarily the water that is conducting electricity. Uh, it's water and electrolytes. Because if, if you uh, if you think back maybe chemistry in high school, we, we used to do this all the time. We would take a, uh, you're going to have to actually uh, YouTube it. Maybe I'll put a link up to it. Take a light bulb, put a couple prongs on it, and try to get some distilled water and stick the prongs in there when the the light bulb is actually plugged in to the outlet and stick those prongs in distilled water and the light bulb will not come on. Water is not necessarily a good conductor of electricity. It's the impurities of the electrolytes that are, that's in the water that causes the current. And that's the same thing with the muscles. The muscles have a lot of electrolytes in them and it also has a lot of water. So it's a good solution for electrical conductivity. So therefore, the current is going to move a lot faster through muscle. So the more muscle mass you have, the faster the current is. The more fat you have, the slower the current's going to be. The accuracy is going to be highly variable with this. Uh, It is greatly affected by hydration level. Uh, And that's kind of the whole principle behind it. Not only hydration level, but also electrolyte, electrolyte level, excuse me. So caffeine, alcohol, any fluid intake at all is going to affect it. And anything that's a diuretic, uh, if you eat a large amount of, or you drink a large amount of water, or maybe eat something that has a large water content right before you do this, it's going to affect the results. Also, exercise itself is going to affect it because you're going to be losing water by sweating during exercise. So if you lose a lot of that water during exercise, if you do this uh, biological impedance analysis before you work out and say it says you were 20% body fat and then you you exercise for an hour, hour and a half and you sweat a lot, uh, you maybe don't drink a lot of water during the exercise and you do it afterward, it's actually going to show that you gained fat mass. All right, which it seems a little odd, but if you think of the principle behind it, you've lost water, you've lost some electrolytes. So now the current, even though you have the same amount of muscle mass, you have the same amount, basically the same amount of fat mass. Right? So the, the amount that you're burning during the exercise is going to make that, that much of a difference. It is, uh, the current is going to be now moving slower th- even through that muscle because you've lost water, all right? And the next one, air displacement plismography. All right, spelling does not count. <laughs> so this is uh, the bod pod. All right, you can see the happy, uh, the happy lady here in the, in the bod pod. So this is air displacement. Uh, this is in contrast to underwater weighing, which is uh, what we'll get into here in a second. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a good piece of equipment. It's a little expensive, relatively expensive, thirty, forty thousand uh, dollars, and and up. I think up to maybe sixty thousand dollars, depending on the options. I I believe it is really accurate. It's really good. Uh, it's fairly simple. Basically, the individual just goes in, sits down for uh, you know a few seconds, and that's it. And you take the measurement. So it's it's really uh, non-invasive 
Uh, you know, the, the only thing is you got to be basically in a bathing suit for it. And which also leads us into hydrostatic weighing, which is kind of the same concept, but in this case, it's going to be water. So instead of displacing air, we're displacing water. So if we look at the hydrostatic weighing, the, the principle here is that muscle, like I described earlier, muscle is going to be more dense. And because it's more dense, it's going to sink versus fat. Fat's going to tend to float a little bit more. So if somebody has a greater muscle mass, they're going to weigh, uh, weigh more when they're in the tank, when they're underwater. And if someone like the guy on the right here, you can see he has maybe a little more fat mass. He weighs less, so he's going to be more buoyant. Now, there's going to be some errors involved with, with this measurement. One of them is going to be air that is uh, the residual volume tra trapped in, in the lungs. When you do this uh, underwater weighing, you breathe out, you exhale forcefully as much as you possibly can before you go underwater, which can kind of be under, uh, uncomfortable because generally before you go underwater, you take a deep breath in, but in this case, you're taking a deep breath out. So you're trying to remove as much air as possible from the lungs. There's still going to be a little bit of residual volume left in there, and that can be, a, uh, that can be taken into account based on uh, age and gender. But again, it's still going to be an estimate. There's going to be a slight error with that. There could be air trapped in the GI tract. If somebody has maybe really loose clothes on, uh, you know, the, the best way to do this is to do it naked, which might not necessarily be all that great you know, group of people. Uh, but even like in a, in a Speedo or uh, shorts or bathing suit, sometimes you can get air bubbles that are trapped between the clothing and you, or maybe even just inside the... Uh, inside the clothing itself. If you ever look at uh, board shorts and uh, swimming shorts, uh, you know, there could be air that is trapped in some of the pockets. All right. So that could throw off the, uh, uh, the weight a little bit. Also hair. If somebody has a lot of hair in her head or maybe just a lot of body hair, you really almost have to mat it down. Once you get in the water kind of get down uh, into the water, wet the hair itself, wet the body, go underneath once and mat everything down. That way that the, a lot of the air bubbles that are trapped underneath the hair and even the hair in the head is now, uh, you know, gone at least as much as possible. So there could be some errors with this, but for the most part, as long as you take the proper precautions and, and, and uh, try to get rid of all the, uh, air that uh, is going to be difficult to account for to actually measure. This is the most accurate, one of the most accurate ways of getting body composition. In fact, for a long period of time, this was known as the gold standard of body composition. All right. Now DEXA has kind of taken over that, but again, DEXA is expensive for, for this. You really only need, some type of body of water and it needs to be still. So a swimming pool, it can't be like in an ocean or a lake or a river or something. It needs to be a still body of water. It needs to be stagnant and you need some type of contraption. Uh, you can make it out of PVC pipe, make a chair out of PVC, PVC pipe and get a scale and just hang it over, uh, over that body of water. So it doesn't take a lot of, uh, of money to, to get something like this, to be able to do this. All right, but you do need to have some materials for it. And skin fold measurements. So this is known as anthropometry. So these are measuring the circumferences or thicknesses of the body. So the principle behind this is that about 50% of our total body fat is subcutaneous, right underneath the skin, right between the skin and the muscle. So you can estimate body density and percentage of body fat from this. Now, once you get the averages of the, um, the skin folds, you can put them into different, different calculations. And, uh, you know, and with the skin fold measurements, you can either do a three site skin fold 
uh, uh, five site, seven site, nine site. I've seen 11 site. I've seen like 12 and 13 sites before. Uh, generally you're going to do like the triceps, the chest, the ab, the thigh, all right, things like that. And, and you can look up the, the specifics of them. Uh, but you use actually, once you get all that and you start to try to figure out body density and percentage of body fat, you use the same calculations that you would for underwater weighing. So for the accuracy of skin fold measurements, about three to 4% plus or minus, you have to kind of take that with a grain of salt because if somebody is really well-trained and they know what they're doing, they've done these over and over again, the sites were measured out and marked to where they're measuring the same spot over and over again, then yes, the accuracy can be plus or minus three or 4%. If it's somebody who has not done a lot of them, uh, maybe the calipers are off. Maybe they're really bad calipers, low cost, uh, you know, plastic ones that could throw it off a little bit. Uh, you know, if they're just not experienced, that accuracy is going to climb dramatically. It could be anywhere from 10 to 15 percent plus or minus. So it could be a wide range. All right. Uh, but as long as everything is is fine, uh, if you look here, these calipers uh, are known as the Lang calipers. You can see a real one uh, online. Just look up Lang skin fold calipers. They're going to be the most expensive ones. They're roughly around $300 approximately, depending on which models you get. Uh, there are cheaper ones that are also good, but they're still going to be like 150 bucks. And you can also get real cheap plastic ones, uh, which do the job. They're okay, uh, but you know they're they're not going to be uh, not going to give you the level of accuracy as uh, something uh, as tuned or precision made as one of the Lang or uh, the mid one that's about one hundred and fifty bucks. I think is the Herpendorf's. All right, so looking at body fatness for health. So looking at the health standards, you can see on average that women will have, uh, you know, about higher, uh, you know, 10% more body fat than, than males. All right. And that, that goes through the entire, uh, age brackets. Now for fitness, uh, men are going to tend to be a little bit lower. And again, these are for optimal standards. And the reason women tend to have more is because of hormones. Obviously, estrogen helps to uh, increase fat mass. And as well as men tend to have more muscle mass, so they're burning more calories throughout the day, which burns more fat. And one point I do want to make, you can see here, uh, it doesn't matter what age group or what gender it is, there is no point uh, where it says, one or two percent body fat. <laughs> Once you get down below five percent, you're starting to put yourself at risk uh, for being too lean. And yes, that that can actually happen. So some fat is necessary uh, for um, uh, for proper functioning, uh, physiologically speaking. All right, let's look at obesity a second. Again, obviously a huge topic in fitness and in health. So looking at the adipocytes specifically, so up to about 30 kilograms of body weight, uh, 30 kilograms of body weight gained or in fat mass, the, uh, the fat grows because of a hypertrophy of the fat cells. Think back to skeletal muscle tissue Increasing the size of the fiber itself is known as hypertrophy. So increasing the fat cell size all right, is going to be the main cause of, uh, of that increase up to 30 kilograms of body weight, approximately. Any more weight gain past that of just fat mass is going to be hyperplasia. So you're gaining fat cells. So you're increasing the number of fat cells. This 
makes it more difficult when someone wants to try to lose weight, it's going to be more difficult to actually reduce the number of fat cells, of adipocytes. So it becomes more and more difficult because those fat cells, you know, they're there and they're going to want to try to store fat. So it's tough to actually lose those actual cells. And there's certain surgical procedures that you could use liposuction uh, and whatnot that you can get rid of some of those fat cells. But again, just doing uh, weight loss normally, it, it's going to be more and more difficult uh, for that to happen. All right, let's look at the set point theory. You probably heard this uh, from different people that, uh, you know, you, you may say or may have heard someone say, you know, I, my, my body prefers to be at a certain weight or, you know, my body prefers to be a certain size. Uh, there could actually be some truth to that. And there, there's some physiological and some psychological reasoning for it. So, again, th this is just a theory for the most part right now, but there, there is some, uh, some possible truth to it. And, and obviously more research is needed to definitively say yes or no, or what, um, what effect it does have. But from a physiological standpoint, you could have biological signals, uh, that are coming in or you have glucose, uh, lipids, just your weight overall, and, and they're going to provide some type of input so there's physiological signals providing some type of input to the hypothalamus, either an increase or, or decrease uh, of them. So maybe you're uh, not ingesting a lot of food. Uh, maybe you're on a diet. Maybe you're uh, really trying to lose weight and, and you have a low amount of glucose, low lipids, you're losing weight. And that sends signals to the hypothalamus, which helps control our appetite and our sleep-wake cycle or hydration, all that good stuff. And it then... Uh, formulates that signal and says, well, we don't like being at this point. We want to try to gain weight. So in turn, we increase the amount in our diet. Then we in turn increase what we were losing and increase our feeding so that we can get back to what would be considered normal. And then obviously exercise is going to be affecting this as, as well, especially the body weight. Now, if we were uh, if we were gaining weight, and say we were uh, our bodies like to be at two hundred pounds, all right, and we were gaining weight, glucose concentration. Uh, maybe we have a high glucose in our blood, high uh, high blood glucose. Our weight's going up, fat cell size is increasing a little bit. Again, that sends another input back to the hypothalamus. Hypothalamus says uh, we don't really like this either. We're getting a little bit too big. So then the output then causes a decrease in the feeding, which then in turn tries to decrease uh, or uh, get back to normalcy for, for the most part, that set point where the body is. Now, from a psychological standpoint, you could have some cognitive signals. And, it, and you can see from the figure here, you know, how do I look? You know, if you start looking in the mirror and you start saying, well, I, I don't know, I, I don't really like how, how I look today or well, the last few weeks, I haven't really looked all that good. You know, I've maybe gained a little bit of weight, size of clothing, maybe the pants start fitting a little bit too tight, uh, perception of effort when exercising, maybe uh, body weight just in just. In, in general, you see on the scale, wow, I, wow, I've gained weight. You know, he's, he went from 200 to 225. And also maybe some concerns about your health could be playing, uh, playing a role with that as well. Again, exercise is going to affect some of this in a positive way, maybe a negative way. Who, who knows? Because if you're not exercising, then how you look may be perceived differently than if you were exercising. So then that signal gets input back uh, in, uh, to an ideal cognitive set point for your body, all right? And your brain, the higher centers in your brain say, uh, you know, maybe I ought to lose a little bit of weight or maybe I need to step back from the dinner table a little earlier, or put down the fork, all those different uh, things that you hear. And, or maybe just increasing exercise, all right, so then that uh, either increase, decrease feeding or increase, decrease exercise 
and goes back and the loop just kind of continues until you just get to that set point and you just try to maintain that body weight. All right. So again, this is just uh, theoretical for the most part. There's been some studies that have been done on it. Uh, whether it is, there is a true set point for the body who, you know, who knows, again, there's going to be some, I'm sure more studies coming out on this. There are some, there is some evidence to show that you can change the set point to where just because you're maybe bigger or maybe you're small and you want to gain some muscle mass doesn't necessarily mean that you can't because, you know, your body has this natural set point. It could just be, that's the set point right now but you could set it to a different weight, uh, a different fat mass, different fat free mass, uh, you know, changing your, your, your lifestyle for the good or for the worse, you know, it's going to, it can go both ways for this. All right. Looking at basal metabolic rate. So this is the, uh, energy expenditure under standard conditions. So when somebody actually measures basal metabolic rate, uh, a researcher will measure it. The individual is laying supine. This is after somebody has slept. And also 12 to 18 hours after eating their last meal. So it, it's similar to resting metabolic rate, even though the two BMR and RMR are used interchangeably, they're not necessarily the same thing. They're basically, for all intents and purposes, they're they're pretty much uh, referred to as the same thing. But basal metabolic rate, uh, there is an actual definition for it where you're supine after sleeping, 12 to 18 hours after eating, usually occurring in a laboratory. And this is normally 60 to 75% of total energy expenditure. And again, that's going to depend on what your activity is throughout the day. If you're exercising a lot, if you're maybe in competition, it's going to be a little bit less than that because you're going to be, uh, you're going to have a lot of calories being burned through exercise through that. And it's also going to be related to fat free mass, uh, which is uh, muscle mass, right? That we're talking about here. And it's generally going to be a little bit lower in women and also older adults. We tend to lose our muscle mass, known as sarcopenia, as we get older. It's also reduced during fasting and dieting states. And what actually uh, happens is that the more and more we starve ourselves, the, the less and less we ingest, and you can see some of these, uh, uh, you have a weeks of semi-starvation. The, the more, or the, the excuse me, the less and less that the we eat and the more and more that we starve ourselves, basically, there's going to be a decrease in thyroid hormones. And this decreases sympathetic nervous system activity. And it, it causes uh, basically an adaptation to where the body thinks that it is going to, knows that it's going to run out at some point of calories you know, wants to try to conserve as many calories as possible that it still has. All right. And that would be the fat, the stored calories that it has in the adipocytes. So it's actually going to slow basal metabolic rate. So it doesn't get rid of all that fat right away. It's going to try to conserve that energy for a later time. It's going to draw it out as long as possible. So that's the main reason why, you know, going on really, you know, starvation diets, crash diets, they don't work, especially for long term, even after a couple of weeks, because your basal metabolic rate is just going to start slowing down and slowing down and keep on slowing down. All right? You're going to lose some weight, but eventually you're going to kind of plateau. You're going to continuously lo lose weight just because you're not eating at all. But at some point you're going to end up having to eat and you're probably going to end up having to binge and all that stuff goes along with it. So proper dieting is the best for that. Uh, but that that uh, that protective mechanism can be good in times of starvation or famine. So that that's definitely a good thing. It's a good side to that. Also, your basal metabolic rate, uh, your genetics could also be determined by your uh, your genetics could determine. Excuse me, your basal meta, basal metabolic rate. All right, thermogenesis. This will be the other uh, one other way that we burn calories throughout the day. 
anywhere from 5 to 40% of your total daily energy expenditure is going to be through th- thermogenesis. Now, it could be because of cold exposure. Uh, if you're shivering, that's thermogenesis. That's known as shivering thermogenesis. Uh, brown adipose tissue could cause something known as non-shivering thermogenesis, uh, which is stimulated by norepinephrine and some thyroid hormones. But generally speaking, this is only going to be occurring, this brown or this non-shivering thermogenesis, usually only occurring in, in infants that have the brown adipose tissue. There hasn't really been any evidence to show that uh, this non-shivering thermogenesis occurs in adults. But also the big portion of this thermogenesis is coming from food. Just the simple act of ingesting food, digesting it, absorbing it, and excreting it, and doing whatever it needs to do with it, all the nutrients, that actually expends a lot of energy. All right, and that uh, that it contributes to a good portion to your uh, to your caloric in, uh, intake and outtake, really. So again, thermogenesis. So the thermic effect of food is going to be the major factor here, uh, as long as you're not you know shivering for long periods of time. And the other one, then the last one, is physical activity and exercise. And again, this is going to be dependent upon how much physical activity you're getting versus exercise. Uh, And it is a good predictor of obesity risk. And we'll see a figure here in in a second of uh, of how well it correlates with that. But just to recap, the the three ways that we're expending energy energy throughout the day, we got basal metabolic rate. That's going to be based on a, a few things here. We got thermogenesis and specifically thermic effect of food. And then we got physical activity and exercise. Now, going back to uh, the uh, being a predictor of obesity risk, you can see here male and female, and both are about the same. We have non basal energy expenditure, which is physical activity and exercise, and percentage of body fat there is a negative correlation. So as we increase non-basal energy expenditure or increase physical activity and exercise, we decrease percentage of body fat. If we decrease the non-basal energy expenditure, we're decreasing exercise and physical activity, then we're increasing percentage of body fat. Right? So this holds pretty true for the most part. And even for both male and female. All right. So this is, I guess, kind of, I don't want to say an obvious graph an obvious figure. Uh, but I, you know, I, I think by now we, we tend to know that the less physical activity that you do, the, the less exercise that, that you do, uh, the more fat mass that somebody tends to possess. And obviously that can lead to some certain, uh, health concerns down the road. All right, that was Chapter 18, Body Composition and Nutrition for Health. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments, uh, or maybe even like the video. Maybe So if you have any questions, let me know, or you can email me. And I thank you for watching.